Good morning. It's nice to see you, so many of you here, although this topic is sort of an old topic, but it seems that's evergreen. And no wonder, fatalities are rare, but when it happens, it affects all of us. And we know it's our friends or, or known people, and we all are involved and would like to discuss it. And thanks to our training and experience, we are all able to analyze individual cases of fatalities and learn from it only if we had enough data about this. When it comes to bird view, then it's not so easy because we are rarely in situations to look into a large number of, of cases. And that's why I will try to tell you today uh, about some terms that if we use them, then probably it will be easier to discuss uh, the causes uh, of fatalities and how to mitigate them. So first about hazards, and then what are the risks, and what are the rates of fatalities. The hazards are many in diving. We all know that, and especially new media know about it. But because anything that has potential to cause harm, either injury or damage, is a hazard. Fortunately, uh, well, there are many in diving. We can, all of you can name them and what, they can, what are the possible consequences. But we know that 99.9% .9 of dives uh, is successful dives because we manage this hazard properly. Well, some of these hazards are bad, and we are all scared of these uh, huge animals and things. So some of us couldn't sleep because of it. But when we jump to swim, we don't think about that. And My movie doesn't work. <laughs> well, but it really uh, happens very rarely. So the risk that you will be eaten by shark is very small. And when we talk about risk, that's probability that this damage or injury will occur. And now, regardless how hazard uh, appear uh, uh, frightening, the risk that it will happen is small, and we have to have that all time in the mind. Even when there are some incidents occur, from incident to injury and death, there is a relatively large uh, path there. And unfortunately, we know that incidents happen, but the final outcome is death is rare. We don't know all this measure of frequency and rates here. We just know in general that the fatal outcomes are rare. Well, mishaps are quite common. And there was one study here. Uh, uh, published its PAMS long, 1978 ago, uh, uh, 1978, that shows quite frequent uh, uh, mishaps, but because we have good training and organization, we overcome these mishaps and uh, the injury does not occur. What helps us to prevent injuries and fatalities, Garrett Locke has very nice presentation in depth about that, and he's talking of this all organizational influences uh, that practically prevent accident, uh, uh, or if they fail one by one, then we get in this accident or incidents uh, situation. So fatalities are few. We know that. And we have statistics about it. We see here the number of deaths by year in United States and Canada in Britain just uh, pertaining to, to BSAC members, Australia, and European Dan. So we can say, wow, United States has the largest number of fatalities. So we are missing here something, and we know what's that. The largest number of divers in the world is in the United States and Canada. And if we want to compare between these populations, we need something that's called rates. And these rates gives us perspective. So they can be per capita rate or per exposure rate. When we talk per capita rate, we say, oh, there is a certain number of deaths at the population of one million or whatever. And over a given period of time, usually a year, we have per capita rate, annual fatality rate per certain number of divers. Or even better, if we have data, we can talk per exposure rate, number of deaths per number of dives. Unfortunately, we rarely have rarely have this kind of information. 
So we are here, if we want to put everything in perspectives, we need numbers, and these are denominators, numbers of divers or participants in diving, and also uh, exposure or, or number of dives per diver per year. There are a few data that are less or more complete, and some of these data I've, I've shown here, and we use this in uh, establishing rates of fatalities. So based on this data, here are some fatality rates. They are given per 100,000 dives or per 100,000 participants per year. And you can see here for PADI trainees, this was published and presented at the, at the fatality workshop and is published in proceedings, is 0 0.49 per 100,000 dives. And it, it is increasing to about four published in Orkney, Scotland, with very demanding dives in cold water, diving in blue. This was from one survey in Canada. So we see that they vary from 0 0.5 per 100,000 dives, or one in 200,000 dives, to one in 25,000 uh, dives. Well, when we put rate per 100,000 participants per year, these rates appear more, uh, d uh, there is more difference here, and that's because the uh, number of dives was not calculated here. When you look down Europe with very high rate per, uh, per participant, that's because most of the insured people, and this was derived based on insured down Europe member, most of the insured diver, they are advanced diver, trainer, instructors, who do most diving per year and do most uh, ex uh, extreme dives, while for example, the America data include average diver and, of course, small, uh, less dives per year and less extreme dive, and that's why there is this big difference in rates. So now I think we have some tools to compare fatality rates, and we use fatality rates to establish risk, to see what's probability. So our past experience is sort of a measure for future risk, risk what we can expect uh, in the future. Yes, that was worldwide. And uh, in the proceedings of fatality workshop, it's break down at various levels and so on, so there's much more details there. So, now we all know the fatality rates vary about, uh, it depend on, on the divers, on the subgroup of diver, on the type of diving, environment, and so on. But we can talk about overall rates, and then we can, if we had data, we could talk about uh, specific fatality rates for various types of activities. We are not yet there because we are missing data. Well, one thing we know from Dan membership, we have quite a good information about Dan members, and we were able to establish fatality rates in Dan members depending on age and sex of divers. So we have learned from that that fatality rates increase with age. And uh, in males it goes practically from the beginning, and females stay pretty low, and then in postmenopausal period they catch up with the males. And this is pretty steep increase here. So it's not that old people are less capable of diving or that they are sick, but definitely uh, a, old age carries certain health risks they may not be uh, properly controlled. So we have some basic measure of the risk, what are there. Now I would like you to think about some uh, causes, how although the risk may be small, deaths are still unwanted, we would like to avoid that. And to be able to uh, start any meaningful action, we need to know what, is, what are the things that are causing these fatalities. So we will talk about triggers and uh, disabling injury cause of death. And this is all in sense of mimicking that root cause analysis. You know, the trouble with diving is that is it always was with drowning, because drowning is what happens at the end, and uh, 
all the investigative uh, uh, institutions were pretty much uh, uh, resignated and didn't do much uh, in this investigation. Uh, drowning covers a lot of the traces and it's very hard to uh, come to the root causes. And especially if you are uh, looking into existing data where you cannot improve the quality of it. So, although we would like to have root cause analysis in every case, we can th think how to improve that in the future. But we wanted to do some kind of root cause analysis in an existing data set. And there are many limitations there. So we said this is kind of a bridged root cause analysis. And we will look in at the trigger as something that's first mishap that occurred during the dive. It's identifiable, although we don't have ability to ask why that happened. But this is first that we have the trace of, and then what's harmful agent, disabling injury, and at the end, what is the cause of the death? And here is one example. Out of air was first noted in this dive. It resulted with emergency ascent, air embolism, and that's what killed the diver, and eventually he drowned because he was disabled on the surface. Or another example, diver got entangled, ran out of air, he's were asphyxiated and drowned, and so on. So here we are looking into some uh, causes that are present and how often they are present, even if we don't know always what practically why this out of air situation came, but that's something that's very common and it's, we know how to act to prevent it. Well, the trouble is that if you approach the large data set as a, each individual case, you, you will never get there to clearly identify what is the bear, deer, or hare, but you have some traces there pretty much washed out and then you are not in the dark, but you are uh, left there with some reduced ability. However, despite it, applying methodology that is described, we discovered our bears, and in this case, it was insufficient air running out of gas. Also, looking at disabling injury, we discovered our deer and hare, and you see arterial gas embolism is the second uh, largest cause of a dis disabling injury and cardiac related problem are third largest cause of disabling injury. So we now know at least that three major causes here contribute to nearly 90% of all accidents and from the perspective of society, it's meaningful to act upon them, focus there and uh, if we reduce them, then we will mitigate, we will reduce fatality rates significantly. There are other causes of that there. We don't ignore that, but these are the major ones that uh, uh, are preventable and we could do something about that. Well, is everything preventable? It's hard to tell. <coughs> now, for example, sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death may be dive related, maybe not. And there are many uh, comments, people say, why if somebody dies from cardiac related death while diving, why you count it as a diving accident? Well, we have to count it as a diving accident because we don't want to be defensive, but also if we look diving fatalities and 25% of diving fatalities is caused by cardiac related events. Diving we spent in diving maybe 25, 30 hours per year. In driving, we spent 500 hours per year. So if, in this, if the chance of dying while diving is just a, a chance alone, independent of diving, then we would expect that causes of fatalities in driving situations are also cardiac related, but indeed seems that only 1% of fatalities in driving are cardiac related to acute cardiac events. So probably, you know, this is not completely same logic, but this tells us it must be, it must be something in diving that provokes this cardiac death and thus we have to admit that cardiac related death in diving 
are diving related. And we have to take care about that as any other uh, cause of uh, diving fatalities. It's even more important to think about this because the average age of divers seems to in be increasing and this is only for done members and they are pretty much reflect what's with the population of divers out there. You can see here that this shows the, the mean age of done members and this shows mean age of fatalities. So definitely because older divers have higher fatality rates, the, uh, their age is in increasing faster than mean age of the divers itself. So we can expect that this problem will grow in the future and have to take care about that now. Looking at some specific risk for cause specific risks in relative to age, we can also see that, for example, divers older than 50 years uh, and divers younger than 50 years, they differ in their risk for cardiac event. And that's about 13 times higher risk for divers over 50 to die in diving from cardiac related death. Probably that risk of divers over, or people over 50 is 10 times higher than risk of people under 50 to die of uh, cardiac related death, but there still is a significant number here. Well, this was all about recreational diving, and I've just touched some points. I will show you a few things from cave diving and rebreather diving to uh, just to make some kind of transition toward what's, what you will be listening tomorrow. And here is fatality data for cave diving. You can see the peak number of deaths, about 80, 18 per year in the early 70s. But also you have noticed that most of it was untrained divers. Once it was realized that lack of training contributes significantly to fatalities and proper training was introduced and pr opportunity for training, the fatality rate started coming down. And in recent years, you can see that it's pretty stable. We could say low in comparison to 70s. And, but now there are few uh, untrained divers among these people and that's sort of a combination of a proper training and also restrictions uh, established on, a, uh, on a access to caves for untrained divers. So this is a proof that societal action can reduce fatality and take control of it. So maybe, you know, it was obvious in the cave diving that it was necessary. It was easy to see how to do it. We still don't know how to do it in the recreational diving or it's not so simple even if we know how to do it. On the other hand, and yes, of course, one note, although the additional hazards in cave diving are so obvious, they didn't change here over the year. They stayed the same, but the risk changed significantly. And now we should uh, think about what the risk for trained divers is completely different than the risk for untrained divers. Recreational divers, uh, rebreather diving, well, there are many new hazards, and you know about that. But we don't all, you know, this can scare us. But in fact, we don't know what the risk is. We know that number of fatalities in uh, rebreather diving has increased over the years. But also we know that number of the users has increased significantly. So without having denominator here, we cannot tell that we are now some kind of, of, of uh, whatever this increase the danger of dying with rebreather. Maybe the rates are now lower than were, were here, but we need denominators to be able to discuss it. Well, I will show you only two slides comparing triggers in recreational diving and in uh, cave diving and closed circuit. As one would expect, running out of gas in open circuit is leading while in cave diving it was lost or entrapment case. And these are the data for the entire period that I've shown before. So it includes uh, both trained and untrained divers. Probably if we 
check uh, risk for train divers only, this would, be, this would give us different picture. In, in rebreather diving, equipment operating issues, not that equipment fail, but interaction between human and equipment, and even including maybe some failure, is a, the, the largest trigger there, and that's understandable because of complexity of the machine itself. Looking at disabling injury, we are again see some differences here. Drowning is leading in cave diving, and that's clear once you run out of gas down there, you uh, practically have no chance. There's no free surface to, to get to the, uh, there and start breathing again, what, as you have in a, a recreational open uh, scuba diving, uh, where arterial gas embolism <coughs> and uh, uh, are equally uh, frequent in open scuba and rebreathers. Cardiac death more in open scuba, and here in rebreathers, the inappropriate gas is a leading uh, disabling injury there. So we have some, even looking from the high, from above, and with not perfect data, we could get some ideas what, uh, where we have to dig deeper and what we could do to improve safety. So uh, without for, uh, going in, in more details, you will have a great speaker, Dan Orr, getting into some life uh, 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 experiences and uh, example of various causes of death, I would like to offer only a few uh, simple conclusions, and that is that we know hazards in divings are many, mishaps are common, but the risk of dying is small, and I would like you to keep that in mind. Well, regardless on that, that is forever, and that's why we are concerned and we want to keep it even smaller. Most mishaps and deaths are preventable, and checklist them out. This is something that you will hear many times over and over here. Dan is starting even one study with recreational divers to see how to improve use of checklist, but that's something that's very important. And then death due to health issues may not be predictable, but it is preventable. And you have to watch your health, because that will keep you long for, for years in diving. In good health and diving, that's uh, the things that goes together. Bad health, you, if you don't take care of your health, it's same as if you don't take care of your dive equipment. Both are maybe catastrophal for you. Thank you very much.